In the pantheon of global central bankers, India's former Reserve Bank Governor Dr. Vaivi Reddy occupies a pride of place. In fact, economist Joseph Stiglitz once said that if Dr. Reddy had been the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 2008, instead of Alan Greenspan, we, the US probably would not have landed in the Lehman crisis. Well, at the moment, the world is in a kind of US-led financial tightening and therefore possibly some crisis. So I have with me Dr. Reddy to understand the global scenario. That's one reason to interview him. But the second big reason to interview him is that his autobiography, Advice and Dissent, is now been published this month in Hindi, titled Vimarsh or Paramarsh. And with that, uh, his memoirs are now available in five languages. I'll read them up. Na uh, Gnapakalu, that is my memoirs in Telugu, Binna Abhipraya, Differing Opinions in Kannada, Daivam Chirikyunna, God Laughs, that's the translation in Malayalam. And of course, the latest Vimarsh or Paramarsh means discussion and consultation. That is in Hindi. Well, Dr. Reddy, thank you very much for giving me your time. Thank you very much, Lata. You've always been very kind to me. Very, <laughs> very pleasant, very pleasant, always cheerful, charming. I can't say anything more than that. Good. Let's start our series. <laughs> okay. Then. No, so, you know, your book is available in five languages. Now Hindi. Why Hindi now, sir? Is it because the government is pushing Hindi? The current regime is? No, let me be frank. Uh, I don't think uh, it was timed by me. It was timed by the Oxford University Press. Okay. Which has undertaken the publication. And I got into an agreement five years back. Okay. But it took their own time, thanks to COVID, Oxford, and okay. all that sort of stuff. Therefore, I am not responsible for the delay. For the timing. Uh, okay. For the timing. And therefore, I am also not taking any pro-Hindi or anti-Hindi stance. <laughs> but okay. I do believe that the mother tongue is important. Mother tongue is very important. And that's why I insisted on bringing my book out in Telugu, which is my mother tongue. Okay. And, and I also feel that you may, you may think acquiring knowledge through English, but still you, acquire, you express wisdom. They're wise only when you think of it in Telugu. I said this earlier also. And so third, first Telugu, that's why. Second one was Kannada. Kannada was another thing. In Kannada, what happened is that, uh, uh, that Professor Sriram, an eminent economist, now what he did was, he first he read the Telugu book, which he liked it. But at the same time, when the moment English was released, mm. he said, this is better because it has a lot of technical also. We said the Kannada people be different of technical also. So he married the two, in a way, as a new product. And okay. again, you can see the title, how it's different. Then there comes third, Professor Thomas. Again, a very economic professor, a very nice person, a thorough gentleman. And he gave a lot more importance to family values. If you read In the, the Malayalam version. Yes, in fact, the Malayalam version. And as you know, if you, if you look at uh, the book and the preface to the book written by all the translators, you'll get this. That if I attach more family to family, I attach more importance to family values. Yes. And then finally, you have the Hindi. Hindi. In Hindi, also, the preface explains why it's very important. And certainly, Hindi is very important for our country. Most important is large population, very large population, Hindi speaking. Second is the age profile. The age profile is a lot more people are younger. So three, at the moment, there's a lot of interest in share markets. So the Hindi belt is becoming conscious. The whole people are, young people also are coming up for concentrating on financial, even for knowledge. It's not available in their own language. Well, uh, since you've given it in many languages, I just wanted to know, what do you want to convey and are the translations honest to what you are conveying? Incidentally, I must tell you some of the dilemmas I faced, okay. perhaps. As a biographer, when I write my autobiography, first thing is, how much should I disclose? How much is confidentiality? Okay. And what I should keep in mind, uh, just to do it, make it uh, very dramatic or simply analytically. Okay. So this is a personal decision I have to take. Okay. And sometimes whenever I felt that public interest does not, Warrant disclosure was not warrant. It was not scandalize people unless it's such a public interest. Okay. So that's what I thought substantively. Secondly, do, are we catering to the reader or are we catering to myself? Okay. So that is, I have to feel like saying something. I want to say something. And therefore I say, then the reader is not in the picture. Okay. The other is I think of what the reader may like. So that's again another choice. Another dilemma. Right. And third, of course, is that you have got to have a choice between the dialect as I mentioned. 
a lot of choices you have to make, a lot of ethical questions that you have to make. For instance, Arun Jaitley pointed out that when the finance minister spoke to me in, 19, in 1988, he did not know that I'm going to disclose the public now. Mm -hmm. Is it moral for me to disclose the public now? Mm -hmm. These are the issues that come up. That you have to tackle. I agree with you. So, but, uh, you know, uh, for me, in your advice and dissent, the chapters uh, uh, 11 to 15, where you tackle the 1991 crisis, is the most interesting. Uh, you know, the reforms still have a magical quality. Today, uh, since then, do you think we have done anything as uh, dramatic or as paradigm changing as 91? Let me start disagreeing with your first statement. Okay. 1991 magically is not correct appreciation. Okay. The correct appreciation is 1991 was a decontrol era. Okay. It's not a reform, it's decontrol. Okay. It has a tight control, license control, right? It relaxed the controls. It did not change the law instantly. Most of the law was not changed. So it deregulation. Okay. So they used to say, I would not exercise this power. Okay. There are a lot of powers that they are exercising before. Mm. Under the deregulated regime, they started saying, I don't exercise this. Yes. Not exercise. So the regulations may uh, they are dilutory. Mm. Whereas uh, after 91, actually during the period of Bajpayee and uh, Shun Sina and Jason Singh, real reform took place in terms of institutional change, law, fiscal responsibility legislation, FEMA. All these things have been brought about by oh. this. So in my view, the, and it's not only my view, Shankaracharya, former chief economic advisor, has written a book on this, uh, where he explains how Ashwin Sinha was the leader of the reform in India. Okay. So first, I won't say 1991 is not dramatic, important, important, politically very important to lose the control. That has been done. That's Pina Sokka and Manmohan Singh okay. can take it. But reform is really Manmohan Singh, not Manmohan Singh, but it's... Vajpayee. Uh, Vajpayee uh, and uh, Ashwin Sinha and Jashwin Singh. Yeah. Okay, sir. Well, uh, but 1991 still is a paradigm shift in our memory. Uh, let me bring you to the present because I think that's what the world wants to hear from you. Uh, like Stiglitz said, uh, you know, the uh, 2008 crisis uh, was because there was loose monetary policy. Now, the U.S. is tightening very dramatically. About 500 basis points of rate hikes in one year is unheard of. What do you think may be the repercussions? Do you think it will be recession? And uh, what may be the repercussions for a country like India? See, we have to, we have to view the, the perspective. See, 1991 reform was of India because the problems in India, which yes. is the rest of the world, not a global, though technically we ascribe it to this uh, oil crisis. Mm. It's not a global in that sense. It's not our reform. Our headache, basically. When it came to 2008, it's not really us in sense. Mm. It's a crisis of financial sector North Atlantic, basically, yes. not us. So even that is not that uh, big a challenge. But this time it's a very big challenge. Very big challenge because the whole global system is changing. And in fact, the balances between the state and market are changing. The balances between state and market, the public and private enterprise, between national and global, these things are <laughs> shaking. And the geopolitical situation has tremendously changed. So these sort of a change which, which is definitely disrupting but definitely not going to end up easily in any particular solution. Okay. So a huge uncertainty that we're living through. And therefore, I think being nimble-footed is good for our policy. See, better to be cautious than over-optimistic. Okay, be, don't be adventurous. And we should be careful about telling people that this is a real problem. So I don't think it's appropriate for us to create false impressions. Uh, but we should... Be, and people are now quite intelligent. They, are, they can understand our position. I think we should, we should really give a balanced view of the challenges. The balance of view is be careful. Okay. But, uh, you know, we often say that we were the fastest growing economy in 2022 and that even after the slowdown to maybe 6%, we will be the fastest growing economy. There is a bit of self-praise uh, uh, when we describe the Indian economy. You think uh, that is dangerous? Is it well-founded? What are the red flags? Let me put it this way. It's not by and large truthful. Nobody can say it's not correct. But you have to also make a distinction. India and its people. India and its people. What's the wealth of India? What's the income of people? Oh. So if we recognize people matter for India, not just India by itself, then have to view it together. And you have to say that this is what India stands for. These are the people. So if you say India is be growing very fast, then you say, what's the per capita income? Bangladesh is growing faster. Okay. So like this, we should keep constantly, at least the readers, and everybody else should keep constantly in, the, in, in mind that things may have to be, you know, may have to see a little more than you read the newspapers that we put it that way. And therefore, I think things are, certainly I think short term is very bright. Certainly short term is 
very bad. Because again, I think I have two situations. One is we are not very well integrated in the globe. Mm. And the globe is Which will work to our right, advantage. Right. So therefore, uh, that's one. And, 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 and secondly, we were ourselves not very much into any ideological position, either politically or economically. We were just somewhere in the middle, left, right, left, right. Left, right. So that ambiguous position of non-commitment to any particular ideology, any particular, we were making advantage, we're taking advantage. And I must compliment the Prime Minister for taking advantage of this particular neutral position, the uncommitted country yes. is giving him a lot of duties now. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, Even geopolitically. Yeah, geopolitically. That's what I mean. So that's why I would say that, that uh, I think people have to be perhaps far more careful than what they are now mm. about the Indian economy and its prospects. Okay. And the society also is going to put in okay. that. But uh, we do have twin deficits. So now a budget will come up uh, in less than a month. Do you think fiscal deficit should be a worry? We ran up a deficit because of COVID. Uh, should that be a very important consideration, considering that this year we will end with a near 3% current account deficit also? First, let me start with the current account deficit. See, current account deficit definitely influences this, the, the medium term view. Because it's not a current account deficit which determines the exchange market. The exchange market are determined by capital account. Mm -hmm. Capital account transactions. So short term fluctuations are entirely due to. So current account deficit may not be built into day to day movements. Current account deficit will be built into structural. Yes. And also the effectiveness of current account deficit in transmission to the exchange is highly diluted. There is no, less for us, supply chain, etc. And therefore, what we have a situation is that current account should be a worry when people assess our fundamentals, mm -hmm. but not for market volatility. For mm -hmm. that, I have to look at capital flows. In the capital flows also, we have we have slight problems also in capital flows because our reserves have been built out of borrowing basically, and more important, the 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 debt portion and particularly the government portion has been increasing a little large now. Okay. So the composition of capital flows requires a careful watch before we attract any more. But at the moment, we are not in danger as far as the current account is concerned. I think I should say that we are, as Rangarajan pointed out in his book, the external sector has been put a firm footing. Mm. And virtually, we have, we have no extent sector is no longer a constraint for our policy. In the last 30 years, we can be very proud. Of, we can be very proud. And then you come to the issue fiscal of deficit. fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit, uh, normally, if the current account deficit is not an immediate problem, fiscal deficit also is not an immediate problem. Again, not because we are great, but simply because most of it is funded and uh, domestic, domestic, uh, domestic bias by the savers and also institutional exploitation. Uh, institutional uh, prescriptions. And then finally, household savings are pretty high. Household financial savings are pretty high. This is a redeeming feature, which always existed, which will continue to exist. That's a, but there's a problem still. The problem is that if we stretch it too far, then it could break down. So we have to be very careful in not stretching it too far. So I wouldn't say, I would not worry about fiscal deficit, but I would certainly worry, but the central government. But the central government. Because people look at central government basically. The macro analysts may prepare, but markets don't look at the totality of the deficit, some yes. national deficit plus. No, they're considerable government of their debt, direct and indirect. Mm. No, the, at the moment it is 6.4% for the current year. And the government has stated its intent to bring it down to 4.5% by 26. That is 200 basis points in three years. You think it should be front loaded that at least 60, 70 basis points of reduction is necessary in FY24? You know, sub 6%, bring it to 5.7 or 5.8. Can you believe it? If you see his <laughs> track record of the government of India, I would be hesitant to believe it till it is proven. Okay. Okay. But uh, that, that uh, should be the goal, would you say? That's right. There's no doubt. Stating the goal is okay. But you should not believe yourself that the goal is reachable okay. quickly. <laughs> see, there are two things. One is what you believe in. Second is what, what uh, you telling others to convince. This is not necessarily the same. No, but should they aim for something under six? Uh, could be. That could, that could be a question mark. Are you fooling the people too often, too much? If you, uh, if you fool the people too often, too much, markets also will smell it. There is a danger, but I think so far some balance, not so much balance, less than perfect balance, but I think something the government of India is delivering in terms of transparency. Yes. But not as much as it's claimed, of course. Not, certainly not as much as it's claimed. But I would say... Uh, I would say, uh, principle-wise, direction-wise, they are right. The movement is very, very, very slow. 
That's true. Okay, so I have to take a break. But I want to speak about the banking sector to you. In a minute, after this break, reforms in the banking sector.